Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me and for the invite. Um, yeah, like Adam said, when he first approached me for this talk, we were just Borealis Wind, and I was the director of operations. So our title for this or for this presentation today was uh, going to be an overview of wind turbine icing and our ice protection system. But like he said, um, we were recently acquired by Fabric Air. Um, so Fabric Air is an international fabric duct supplier, um, and they're uh, critical for the success of our product. And uh, we're very happy to join their team recently. So I'm transitioning from director of operations over to director of technology, but the title of today's presentation hasn't changed. So we're still gonna be talking just about wind turbine icing and ice protection systems. Um, but first, just a little bit of background about wind power around the world. Um, so on the left here, we see the total installed capacity around the world, and on the right, the installed capacity in Europe and North America. So back in 2002, there was less than 0.25% of the energy produced in North America was from wind. Um, but as of last year, that number grew to almost 9% of the entire energy grid. Um, and with this increased reliance on wind as a major percentage of our energy grid, we also need to in increase the reliability of, of wind. So in North America and in Europe, one of the biggest problems for reliable wind energy is icing. Uh, so this map here uh, we did in uh, collaboration with uh, VTT, which is a university in uh, the Scandinavian countries. Um, it maps the severity of icing uh, across the world. So in red, we have very severe icing. Um, in yellow, there's moderate icing. And in green, uh, it's rare to see icing. But if anyone has been keeping up with the news, they've probably heard uh, in Texas, uh, which is square in our green zone here, uh, experienced some very significant icing events, which shut down their entire grid for uh, days at a time and resulted even in multiple deaths. Um, so it's a problem everywhere um, around the world. Um, and right now there's over 47,000 turbines in North America and in Europe that have the potential to be retrofitted with our ice protection system. Um, plus we're experiencing about a 12% growth of new wind turbines being installed every year. Um, but what is the problem of wind turbine? Like we've, we've, or wind turbine icing, we've been able to quantify it. Um, and the part that everyone typically sees and cares about is the revenue loss or the production loss. So, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, we're able to pretty easily quantify that at about $35,000 a year of, of, of revenue loss. If there's one week of icing, uh, but there's also other issues. So. The ice builds up on the leading edge of the blade and when it is ready to come off, it can be flung off. Um, and so that can cause other safety incidences, which can be quantified at about $4,000 a year. Um, when it gets flung off, it can also hit machinery. So you have to replace or repair that machinery, which can also lead to about $3,000 a year in damages. Um, the increased ice on those blades also introduces vibrations and mass imbalances, um, which decreases the lifespan of the major components of these wind turbines. So those major components need to be swapped out um, maybe once every 10 years. Uh, so that's amortized down to about a $5,000 a year cost. Um, and then not even just the damage that's occurring on site, but also, when you can't supply the government with the energy that you told them that you were going to supply them with, they also fine you. So we can get up to about $3,000 a year in fines if you aren't supplying the energy that you said you were going to cost. Uh, so what are the solutions out there? Um, there's really two solutions. Uh, there are retrofit solutions, or there's solutions that are installed by the original equipment manufacturers, so the OEMs. Um, the retrofit market is the one that we are specifically targeting um, because right now 
the available retrofits out there on the market are either way too expensive for the payback um, or they're just ineffective. So there's really two types of existing solutions in the retrofit market. One are the external and embedded heating mats. So that's uh, displayed in the top image here. You need to get a crane on site to detach the blade, bring it down to the ground, grind off layers of the, of the fiberglass, lay your conductive heating mats in it, lay more fiberglass on top of that blade, and then reinstall or reattach that blade to the, to the wind turbine. So this is a huge undertaking, and this really only makes sense for wind farms that are experiencing extremely severe icing. The uh, less expensive option is coatings. And uh, we know from aerospace that coatings and de-icing works um, for very short periods of times. Uh, you can see here in the bottom image, we have a helicopter that's spraying glycol on the blade to remove the ice from the leading edge. Um, so it's working, but again, the helicopter is extremely expensive to, to, to deploy. And this only works for a short period of time. Um, there's also evidence out there that's starting to point towards um, pitting, which makes the coatings even less effective than just the bare blade surface after multiple years of exposure to environmental conditions. Uh, that leads us with the O&M market as well. So historically, O&Ms have not focused on this problem. They've had little incentive to do so. Um, and therefore, they, there's very few ready-made solutions that exist today. And in most cases, if they exist, they only exist in niche markets. For example, they'll only sell in Europe. So that's where Borealis came in. Um, we wanted to create a simple and effective solution. Um, so we have an internal heating system that consists of a blower, a heater, and the critical fabric duct. Um, so we push hot air uh, down the leading edge of the blade through the duct and then allow it to return along that surface inside the blade to heat the blade from the inside out, just like what you would do when you're heating your car windshield on, on an icy day. Uh, we also have control system integration. So our entire control system, we'll talk about the tech stack in a couple of minutes, but we integrate fully into the turbine safety chain and we collect data from the existing SCADA system on site. Uh, we're also fully integrated in ice sensor uh, or ice detection sensors um, so that we can start our system as soon as the icing event begins before the turbine even experiences power loss. So a little bit of a breakdown of our product. Um, on the right here, you can see it. Um, the major sections of the turbine that we're installed in. And on the left, we have it broken down. So it's an internal hot air blade heating system. Uh, we have control cabinets located in the hub, in the blade, and in the nacelle. Uh, we're component certified, um, and we have over five years of in-field product success. So we've generated a lot of IP around this product, being on the cutting edge of the industry. But what we also saw was that our customers didn't just want a heating system, they wanted a fully integrated system. So we started also creating feeder circuits. So we can also bring the power from the ground up to the tower if the available power isn't there for us to draw from. Uh, we're also fully integrated, like I said, into ice detection sensors. So our major um, uh, collaborators are IceTech, Phosphorex, and Eologix. Um, and we also offer multiple services. Um, so not only do we design and build the product, but we also install and commission the product. And then certain customers also request maintenance and operating um, uh, services. So we will be able to manually start the system if necessary. And we have uh, uh, live feedback for how our systems are performing and the state of their health. Um, I wanted to show a little bit about how the product uh, performs. So this is an infrared photo of one of the turbines that our duct is installed in. Um, so you can see that there's a few crosses on the um, infrared photo, SP4, SP3, and SP2. So those are measuring the external temperature of the blade. So in the top left corner, we can see that SP4 is at 13 degrees Celsius 
um, and that SP3 is about 11 and SP2 is at about 8. Um, we can also see that the external temperature, so the temperature of EL1, uh, is minus 8 degrees Celsius. So we do a little bit of averaging here. And, um, for this scenario, we're considering this a wind speed of 6 meters per second, wind temperature of minus 7. Our internal blade temperature was set to 32 degrees Celsius, which gives us an external temperature of 11 degrees Celsius. And so in this scenario, we would be able to successfully prevent ice from accumulating and remove any ice that had accumulated before the system began to heat. Uh, this is an example sent to us from one of our uh, site technicians. So there's five towers that are all very close to each other. Only one of them is installed with the Borealis ice protection system. Um, we won't do a quiz or anything to, to try and see how many people can guess which one the ice protection system is in, but uh, it's B in case anyone was curious. Uh, we also do a vent analysis. So as part of our full service plan, uh, we do automatic analysis. Um, uh, this is one of the real world examples that's been normalized so that we can uh, uh, display it. We have four graphs. Each graph is showing the power that that turbine is producing or should have produced uh, across uh, a one week period. Um, so the experimental graph up at the very top is the turbine that's installed with the Borealis IPS. Um, and it has three control turbines, which are neighboring turbines, just like what we saw in the previous video. Um, on the top graph, the blue box is when ice was detected. The red boxes show when the Borealis system was on. And it's a little difficult to see, but the Borealis system is on during every time that the blue box is present, as well as additional time. The red line shows how much power the turbine should have produced um, based off of the wind speed. And then the black line shows how much power the turbine actually produced during that time. So if there's a difference between the red line and the black line, that's because there was ice on those blades and it wasn't able to produce power. Um, so this is an extreme case where the turbines that were iced completely shut down. This is uh, exactly like what we saw happen in Texas. Um, and this is exactly what we want to prevent. So you can see the Borealis system was able to produce at least 80% of the power during uh, some of the intense periods and got back up to 90%, 100%, much quicker than the control turbines did. So without the IPS, the turbine would have lost around 190 megawatt hours of power. And at about $70 a megawatt hour, that comes up to about $14,000 of revenue lost. Um, so we were very happy to, for our customer to uh, prevent that loss in this event. Now, really quickly, just one slide here about our tech stack. So unfortunately, I'm not, I'm not at liberty to dive too much into exactly what our tech stack is, but from our highest level point of view, um, we have uh, a PLC, which we install inside each tower. We have three uh, PLC couplers, which are dummy controllers installed each blade. Um, the PLC is responsible for modulating the heat and the temperature inside the blades. The dummy controllers are essentially just there to receive sensor inputs and to control our electrical actuators. Um, so how much power is being supplied to each component. Um, we connect or we tell the PLC when it should be on and off from our server. So we have one server installed at each customer site. Um, that server is also responsible for accepting information from the turbine that we aren't generating. Um, and it's also responsible for displaying a user interface for the on-site technicians so that they can check in on the Borealis system and manually activate it if they need to. We have communication from our on-site server to our Borealis office server, uh, where we uh, duplicate our databases and do post-process uh, analysis, um, generate our reports and determine how much or, or the health of our system and what our performances of our systems 
We also integrated, or we're recently integrating with uh, the cloud. Uh, we want to create a dashboard for all of that information for all of our databases and to create backups. Uh, we also have uh, like automatic notifications of the health of our systems so that the people who are monitoring these systems um, don't have to actively monitor it. They can passively monitor and step in when an error notification pops up. So yeah, uh, like I said on the right here, we have PLCs, um, specifically the logic in the PLC has two purposes. One is for temperature control. We're using Bebo stability and PID control for that and some custom error handling. We work primarily with Omron and Phoenix contact PLCs. Um, communication from our sensors, like I said, is either analog or digital. Um, communication across our PLCs and PLC couplers is Ethernet IP. Uh, communication for our, from the SCADA system, from the customer SCADA system to our servers over Modbus, and we transfer everything between our servers over FTP. Um, our servers are always Microsoft. Um, our SCADA and user interface that we use right now is Indusoft, um, but we're looking to switch that over to um, uh, microservices. Our databases right now are MySQL, but like I said, we're integrating into the cloud. So we're moving to Azure SQL um, and the majority of the services are done through task scheduler and executed by Python. And our dashboard that we're using right now is uh, Grafana and our notifications are done through Microsoft Teams. Um, yeah, so I hope from this presentation, you're able to learn something a little bit new about wind energy. Um, and see that we don't just have to live with the problem of icing, um, but that Borealis has created a simple and effective solution that will help make wind energy more reliable as we uh, move into a more green energy grid.